I am really happy to introduce uh, Dr. Cynthia Reed. She's here in Tucson, Arizona, and she is one of our stellar movement disorder physicians, expert in Parkinson's disease, and she's going to talk with us today about um, keeping it moving, digestion and the gut and Parkinson's disease. So take it away. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, one thing I just wanted to say first, this is April, and April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Um, actually, I'm not sure like who to talk to because I'm looking at me on the screen. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but anyway, oh, I froze you. This is odd. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is Parkinson's Awareness Month, and 2017 is the 200th anniversary of James Parkinson um, writing the first paper on Parkinson's disease. That's when he identified it and wrote a paper to describe it. So 200 year anniversary of that. And then 50 years ago in 1967, when I came out, is when um, the first medication specifically for Parkinson's came out and that's levodopa. So it's an exciting time and there's a lot of new things that we're learning over time. And there's even um, just a little tidbit is that there's one new medication that was approved last week, not last week, last month, sorry, last month, and two more that are coming out soon. Um, briefly, the first one that is already approved that will be coming out is similar to Azelect or Selegiline, and the um, other two that are coming out are, I would call them rescue medications. So when people have more, more advanced disease, their medication wears off, then they have to wait till it kicks in again for that next dose. These two that are coming out are like a bridge that will smooth that over. So that's really exciting too. So we're going to talk about the gut today. And I was going to, since there's several things that can be involved in it, like drooling and, and difficulty swallowing are also part of it. But I was going to start with, well, I guess we can start there. That'll be fine. Um, drooling is one thing that happens in Parkinson's disease from, not necessarily from making more saliva, but from swallowing less often and swallowing less uh, completely. And so because you swallow less, then your saliva can build up in your mouth. And if you're not paying attention and you're concentrating on something, your mouth is hanging open, what happens? You drool. And so that's something that's... Um, mostly embarrassing socially and can be a huge problem. So one of the simplest ways to deal with it is to use either a piece of hard candy, preferably sugar-free that you suck on, and that reminds your brain to swallow more often, or chew gum that also stimulates swallowing and helps remind you to clear that saliva out of your mouth. Um, certainly, there's times where the PD medications just start controlling the Parkinson's disease adequately. And so perhaps the PD medications to be more effective would help the, the drooling as well, but that's not a guarantee. There are some way other like oral medications and other treatments to treat drooling. One of those is an eye drop that normally an eye doctor would use in your eyes and it would dilate the pupil. So it's something that we use in the mouth. You don't want to use it in your eyes. It's called atropine. And so you can take a couple drops of atropine on your tongue or under the tongue, and that can help dry up the saliva. Any of these medications for the, for the drooling may or may not help. It's trial and error. They're not the greatest, but in some cases they help enough to make it worth taking them. Um, one benefit of using the eye drops under the tongue is that that is just a more local treatment instead of taking the next option, which is a pill, an oral medication. The problem with oral medications, they not only dry up your saliva, they dry up everything else. So constipation can get worse and can be difficult to urinate, and those can be problems. Um, rarely, Parkinson's is caused or the, the drooling in Parkinson's is caused by excessive production of saliva from the saliva glands. There's one on each side of the cheek and two under here and one right under the chin here. And if you have increased production, then certainly you may want to use one of the oral medications as long as you don't have the constipation problem. But another option 
that is focal just in this area and doesn't cause other side effects is Botox or botulinum toxin injections. Those injections can be given right into the saliva glands and cause the saliva gland to make less saliva. The problem there, or not the, the caution there, is that kind of twofold. One is that the saliva is necessary for healthy teeth. So if you cut out too much saliva production, your mouth is too dry, your teeth are going to suffer as well. Um, and I forgot what the other one is. <laughs> but anyway, um, I don't remember what the other problem with it is. But anyway, oh, never mind. I don't know. So um, you don't want to dry up too much saliva because that'll hurt your teeth. Um, related to too much saliva and not swallowing is swallowing problems. Swallowing problems in Parkinson's um, involve all the little, there's all kinds of little tiny muscles in the throat that are used to swallow and they have to coordinate together in order to swallow. Um, the upper one third of the esophagus, so the, the esophagus is the tube, it's a muscular tube that goes from the throat down to the stomach. And the upper one third of that is a skeletal muscle, similar to the arms and legs. So certainly that part and all these little muscles up here, they can respond to Parkinson medications somewhat. So again, if the Parkinson's is not well controlled, it may help to just get the Parkinson's well controlled and then those muscles will work better. It's like when the arms and legs are stiff and slow, not moving well, well, it might be that these muscles are stiff and slow and not moving well. Um, anything below about the top one third of the esophagus down here further is uh, controlled by the autonomic nervous system, similar to the gut. And all the nerves that control the gut um, are also affected by Parkinson's disease, but in a different way. Um, so changing your Parkinson medications isn't necessarily going to help that part down there. Uh, one of the problems of not paying attention to whether or not you're having trouble swallowing is that you could get things down the wrong tube. And if you do, that's called aspiration, where you get it into your lungs, and that can lead to a pneumonia or you know, something further. Um, that is something we don't want in Parkinson's because it, at least it's a great risk of a lot of other complications. When you do notice that either you or somebody you know with Parkinson's is having difficulty it might just be difficulty swallowing your pills. It could be difficulty uh, choking when you drink liquids or difficulty getting foods down. You might be able to deal, you know, it might be a minor thing. You might be able to deal with it on your own, such as um, simply avoiding certain foods. Foods like potato chips, rice, little pieces that tend to get stuck. Those are a big problem. So it might be something where you can simply adjust your diet and you're doing fine. But as time goes on, we really need to pay attention to that because if we let it go, again, there's that risk of aspiration where that can cause problems. When it is enough of a problem, uh, let your doctor know and your doctor will send you to a speech therapist who can do a swallow study. A swallow study is done with different uh, substances of food, consistencies of food that have barium in it so that they can monitor the swallowing. They can watch the mouth, the, the um, tongue, the throat work and make a, a determination of how to best help you compared to anybody else. Um, the things that the speech therapist might do as a result of this swallow study, they might uh, recommend further evaluation by an ear, nose, throat mm -hmm. doctor who generally might take a, a smaller camera and just look at the mm -hmm. upper part of the throat. The upper part of the throat is called the pharynx. And so they might just look at that part, see the, the voice box, the little flap that closes off the lungs, and then um, make sure that part's okay. The speech therapist also might send you to a GI doctor. And the GI doctor 
might do an endoscope, which is a camera all the way down looking at the whole length of the esophagus to see what's causing difficulty swallowing, because it's not always up here, sometimes it's down further. <clears throat> as far as what the speech therapist might recommend for um, during mealtime, again, optimizing the Parkinson medications to make sure they're working as well as possible. It might be appropriate to time doses of levodopa or medications say an hour before you eat so that all these muscles are working maximally at the time of the meal. Altering dietary uh, consistency, meaning sometimes people will need to um, use just soft foods, soft foods that have a very even consistency, something like mashed potatoes or pudding. A lot of times it's not that bad and it's just simply avoiding meat or making sure that if meat is eaten, it's cooked in a way that it's very moist or cut in very small pieces. Avoid things like bread that can get clumped up and, and get caught. Um, for liquids, if liquids are a problem, there are uh, substances available that are called thickeners that can thicken your liquid. You take a spoonful of it, you stir it into your liquid, and then it's nectar thick instead of being thin. So it'll have less likelihood of going down the wrong tube. Um, for for mealtimes also, it's important to not hurry. If you're hurrying, you're not going to be concentrating on what you're doing. Minimize distractions. Don't try and watch TV or listen to the radio while you're eating. Minimize conversations. Just concentrate on the process of chewing, swallowing, taking a drink to clear that out, chewing the next bite. So you do everything properly. It can also help to sit upright, get up, up, upright in my chair, sit upright more and keep the tin, chin tucked a little bit to get the throat opened up better and, and protect things. For pills, if pills are a problem, sometimes people know tablets for them are better or perhaps capsules are better. And whichever works better for you, ask your doctor, can you change your medications, as many of them as possible, to the formula that's easiest to eat for you or to take for you. Some medications have liquid formulations. Some of the Parkinson medications even have orally dissolvable formulations where you just lay it on your tongue, let it dissolve, and you don't have to swallow at all. There's also options. Um, the dopamine agonist medications like Mirapex and, and Requip, those both require oral pills. But a third option is Nupro patch, which allows you to use a patch and avoid swallowing altogether. Uh, the, probably the newest carbidopa levodopa out is called the Duopa gel. It is a gel form of levodopa that comes in a, a square little cassette and you hook it up to a pump and it, it's delivered into the GI tract directly. And that consistently drips the medication in over the day, 16 hours a day, and it's very, very smooth. And so that um, avoids the swallowing and it can help some of the motor complications of Parkinson's where you have the up, down, up, down all day long from your medications. Um, if you do experience an episode of choking, if you can still get some air or talk in some way, then um, the recommendation is generally not to go try Heimlich or try digging anything out with your finger, but just try and um, take a, if, close your mouth and through your nose, take a breath so that you can get some air and that will help to prevent a panic attack from starting, which can be very difficult to get out of once you get into it. However, there are times if you can't get any air in or out, then the next step is that somebody might need, if, if there's anybody around, they need to try the Heimlich maneuver. That is something that can be, um, it's, you can find out about it online. Uh, quickly, I guess it, I'll, I'll explain it quickly. Um, the person doing it has their hand in a fist with their thumb pointed towards the person's chest. The other hand is like this, and it goes, you wrap your arms right around the person and put that thumb right below the um, end of the breastbone right there, and you're going to give some quick thrusts up like that. 
that's something that it's it's best to go ahead and do some basic safety course to learn how to do it. Um, if you're alone though, and there's nobody around to do that, you can actually find like a chair, like a, a chair that you can hang yourself over and you can use the chair and uh, push out with your, push out onto your abdomen to do the Heimlich on yourself. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it can. Um, so we're gonna move down the GI tract a little bit. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and just show the picture of the GI tract if you can pull that up. We're going to talk first about the stomach area. You bet. Okay, and then we're let going me to get that about, for you. And, and everybody, hopefully everybody can see that. I think it looks like well, it's yeah. in here. Let me get rid of this. Okay, now, do you want me to make it a little smaller? This? No, that, that's fine. That's fine right there. Because well, we'll just look at half at a time. So anyway, yeah, just go back to big and big. So this top part is just showing you, you've got the mouth here. There's the pink is the opening. That's the opening. There's some opening in your nose, opening in your mouth. They come together back here. And then there's a, um, a flap down here that closes the uh, lungs off when you swallow. But the salivary glands, there's one located in the cheek and some located under the chin. So that's kind of what we've been talking about for that part. And then go ahead and move it up to the bottom of this bottom part of the page. There you go. So now we're gonna talk about this area of the GI tract. The um, right after the stomach is the, the small intestine, this colored, brightly colored part is the small intestine. And then the pale part in the background that goes up, over and down, that's the large intestine or the colon. So the problems in the GI tract with Parkinson's, all the, all the nerves that control this, this whole system can be affected by the changes that affect, the, that cause the Parkinson's in the brain. So the nerves that control these organs uh, get damaged. And so then what happens? This whole GI system slows down. The movements through the stomach slow down and the movements through the intestines slow down. If you've ever been on a farm and had to milk a cow or a goat or something, you know how you have to um, move your hand like the top finger first, then the next thing, and the next finger, and you're kind of to milk something. And that's the type of muscular movements that happen through this entire system to make the food move from one part to the next. Um, one other thing to point out, while well, we're still looking at the picture then, the first part of the small intestine is called the duodenum or the duodenum. That's the part where your levodopa actually is absorbed. So, it, it doesn't absorb in the stomach. It has to go a little bit further to the duodenum to get absorbed. If it goes past the duodenum, it's too far along to get absorbed at that point. Okay, so we can go back to just regular picture. So the milking motion is something like this, where it just goes, um, you know, the tube slowly has waves of muscle uh, contraction that go through it. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is in the stomach. When the stomach slows down and quits moving through, that's called gastroparesis. So paresis is slowness or weakness and gastro refers to stomach. When your stomach slows down, you eat a meal and after the meal, you feel bloated or uncomfortable. And even during the meal, it feels like your stomach is filling up too quickly. You get full fast. They call that early satiety. So what can you do about that? One thing is to eat smaller, more frequent meals and eat snacks throughout the day because you're not gonna be able to eat just one or two huge meals and tolerate it. And if you don't eat enough, you're gonna end up losing weight, which we'll come to in just a little bit. 
Other things that you can do for the gastroparesis, you can get rid of certain medications that exacerbate it. There's medicines that your other doctors will use for urinary symptoms, for blood pressure, for heart, and some of the Parkinson medications have anticholinergic effects. Um, the main anticholinergic medications that are sometimes used in Parkinson's are called um, trihexyphenidyl, brand name Artane, or Cogentin, which is generic um, benztropine. So those two are very anticholinergic and very much slow down the gut, but also amantadine. Some people are using amantadine and that can have anticholinergic effects. Also, um, the urinary meds, some of those like oxybutynin, those can slow things down. So at some point you have to decide, you know, is it worth it to continue using these medications because of the possible side effects? There's a medicine that is used for slowness of the gut in other diseases that is definitely one you should avoid in Parkinson's. It's called red gland or metoclopramide. That is one that they can use in other diseases, but it actually blocks the dopamine. And so it makes Parkinson's symptoms worse. There is one medication similar to that, uh, that you, uh, I don't remember if it was ever um, approved here in the United States. It's called Domperidone. And sometimes that'll be used, but you have to get it from another country. It's not FDA approved here in the United States. One of the biggest problems with this gastroparesis, the slowness of the things going through the stomach, is that you may, you may not absorb things properly, particularly your levodopa, not because you're supposed to absorb it in the stomach, but because it can't get from the stomach to the small intestine where you're hoping to absorb it. So again, some of the alternative therapies you can use for the levodopa itself, there's an orally dissolvable form of that, that avoids the stomach, so it directly absorbs into the bloodstream here. Patches, um, for, for the Parkinson's, you can use the Nupro patch. Uh, for the cognitive problems, you can use Exelon patch. And then there's things such as the deep brain stimulation that works by a completely different mechanism from the gut. Um, the newest Duopa gel, which is a levodopa gel, that also, it it's delivered right into the duodenum and avoids the stomach altogether. So that's another option. Next thing we're gonna mention is um, bowel dysfunction, meaning the large intestine and the small intestine, so the, the intestines. When you slow the movement of things through the intestines, you have reduced frequency of your bowel movements it also allows the body more time to absorb water from the gut so the stool gets drier and that's also making it harder to pass by definition if you have three if you have less than three bowel movements per week that would be consistent with constipation and then another problem that's similar but different is difficulty with actually eliminating or defecating meaning you have to excessively strain to um, get things out or you only partly empty. Um, some things that you can do to prevent all this from happening in the first place, the biggest one by far and the simplest one to do is increase water intake using about six to eight glasses, eight ounce glasses of water per day can help to keep things moving smoothly, keep the um, enough fluid in the body and in the stool to keep it soft and keep it moving. Dietary fiber is the second biggest and simplest way to deal with it. Things like um, the fruits and vegetables in your diet are extremely important. Vegetables are important because of the fiber that they have and the fruits are important because they have extra uh, water, extra fluid in them that counts towards the fluid intake. And the third simple thing that's you know, very easy to do that, that we may not do, that we're supposed to do, exercise. Anytime you're moving your body up and down, moving around, actual exercise or just activity, 
it helps the gut to move along. And so that helps prevent it. Um, there's some medications again that slow things down. It's the same as what we talked for in the stomach. So anything anticholinergic will slow down the gut and you may need to discontinue those types of medications. Um, for the fiber, if you can't seem to get enough in your diet, other ways to get it include using bran um, and Metamucil is a, is a naturally occurring form of, of fiber that um, you can use. There's a recipe that you can find in Parkinson books that uses one cup of bran, one cup of applesauce, and one cup of prune juice. And you mix it together, you store it in the refrigerator, and each morning, eat two tablespoons of it. So that can be a real help. It's called, um, I think, I don't remember what they call it, just a fruit paste or something. Um, some other things about this, let's see. Stress, travel, changes in your routine, definitely that can throw a monkey wrench in and, uh, and contribute to constipation. Other uh, medications like antacids that contain calcium or aluminum, they can worsen constipation. And then pain pills. Pain pills is another one that can worsen constipation. Um, I, don't, so I don't know if any of you have seen, there is a video on, the, on YouTube for a device called the Squatty Potty, Squatty Potty. And basically it's a little stool for your feet. When you go to use the toilet, you're sitting there with your feet on the floor. Well, in other countries, they squat in order to go to the bathroom. So their body and their legs are uh, more of an angle. Instead of sitting, they're more like this. And so the Squatty Potty <laughs> is one of the one new invention that's out there to help with constipation. And the thinking is that there's, there's a, um, um, a ligament that goes around the colon before, right before it goes out of the body. And that when you're, when you're seated, that ligament is not in the optimum position, but when you squat, then it loosens that ligament and allows the stool to come out better. So that's something that, some people have used that or just used some kind of a stool under their feet to elevate their feet when they're on the, on the toilet, and that can help too. Um, is there anything we didn't cover? Oh, um, a couple last things. Weight loss in general is a problem from the GI tract. Some, there's, it's poorly understood, but there are several causes, and so the main thing is treat the causes. Causes can be nausea. It can be the difficulty swallowing. It could be the fact that it takes so long to eat that you just get fed up with eating and you get full before you're really full. Uncontrolled tremors can um, make it take longer to eat, so that's another issue, or uncontrolled dyskinesia, either because it's difficult to feed yourself or because the dyskinesia or the tremors, either one might be using up so much of your energy that you just aren't taking in enough calories to make up the difference. Um, in general, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, in their end stages, they, they can be associated with a lot of weight loss, um, but that tends to be in the end stages. And so if you're having weight loss early and it's not one of these other reasons, then you really should check with your doctor and make sure that there's not something else going on. The basic treatment for, new, for weight loss is either treat those problems or, and or concentrate on eating foods that are nutrient dense. So something like a salad that takes a long time to eat and gives you very few calories, not a good idea. Something that has much more density um, of, of calories in it. Um, I don't know, like, like um, adding butter or sour cream to mashed potato. That adds a lot of calories with just a little bit of, of substance. Um, and then the last, the last thing is related to the nausea itself. Um, nausea can be caused by the slowness of the gut. Again, it can be caused by the medications, the levodopa itself. If it's the levodopa itself, you can try different things. Normally, 
you might be told to take the levodopa alone without food so that you get maximum absorption from it. But if you've got nausea and you take it on an empty stomach, your nausea is going to be worse. So in that case, if you take the levodopa with food, that will help to calm that nausea down and might be all you need to do to treat the problem. If you're using levodopa immediate release, it has a big peak of absorption. It gets in the system fast and that's going to contribute to more nausea. So trying a controlled release form that's just a lower peak that's slower to take effect might lessen nausea. Again, you can try the orally dissolvable tablets that um, avoid the gut. And I've had a lot of patients that have used those oral dissolvable pills when nothing else works and they can actually tolerate those. Some of the things we can add, we can add more carbidopa. So your, your pills have carbidopa and levodopa. Levodopa is the active ingredient that you need to treat your Parkinson's. And the only reason that carbidopa was put in was to block nausea. But they didn't know how much to put in when they first came up with it. They tried 10 100, it wasn't enough, so then they increased it to 25 100. That helped enough people that they've stopped at that, but sometimes people need a whole extra tablet of 25 milligrams of carbidopa to help block the nausea. Uh, sometimes people will actually um, use nausea meds that are used for other things like chemotherapy and that can help. Um, there are some common nausea meds for other diseases that should be avoided in Parkinson's disease. Some of, the, some of these are metoclopramide, prochlorperazine, and promethazine. Those are medications that block the dopamine in the brain, and so they're going to make your Parkinson's worse. So you want to make sure not to use those. Um, some of the things I sent to Sarah that she will put in the link on the web, one of them is a sheet from the APDA that shows various medications to avoid in Parkinson's, and those nausea meds are on there, so you can find those specifically. Um, for the nausea, you can also use alternative ther therapies for that. Deep brain stimulation um, is a way to completely avoid the gut again and prevent nausea. And then I don't have any data to show it, but I have tried some patients on the new pro patch for the reason of nausea, hoping that maybe it's not going through the gut as well, or gut as much as the oral pills. And I have gotten some people to tolerate that where they couldn't tolerate others. And I'm not sure about the new medication, the Duopa. Is it possible that that too might be something that will prevent nausea? It's, it's hard to say at this point until we get more experience with it. So that is pretty much all I had. Um, and we can open it up for questions now, if you'd like to. Okay, so feel free to type your questions into the chat. And, um, and again, remember you can send them to me privately. Just choose my name and you can send them privately. So, um, okay, so here's the first question. Oh, there's the, the oh, document I was just gonna show you. that um, this, Dr. Reed. This, this is another thing. Oh, just like, I forgot, sorry. This is another thing that I put in the um, things that Sarah will have online. It's a whole brochure on constipation, uh, four pages from the APDA, and it goes into all the, um, like, different over-the-counter things to use, the different... Uh, you know, Metamucil, Miralax, whatever. So that's a good resource too. So, okay, first question. Go ahead. Great. Um, and you know what? We will link all of those things. We're going to put this in our e-news as well as a link to all of the different um, materials that you sent because they're really good. And she sent like four different things for, for you guys. So I will put all of that into the e-news. And like I said, that'll go out in the next week or so. Um, so we have a question and one is, um, how long before you're diagnosed with Parkinson's does, does constipation begin? That is an excellent question because actually constipation can be one of the precursor symptoms to Parkinson's. Constipation can start 10 or 20 years before you've ever gotten tremors or slowness so that a doctor can diagnose Parkinson's. So it's, it's nonspecific to Parkinson's, 
but it can start 10 to 20 years before. Wow, okay. Um, another question is um, the difference between a laxative and Miralax, or is there a difference? Yeah, Miralax does have lax in the name. Um, it is a type of, uh, I'm thinking it's, oh, here, it's over here. Uh, there's, see, there's different types of laxatives. So I will qualify this with the fact that I am not a GI doctor, but where is it? Oh, not welcoming me. Of course, here it is. So the Miralax is a hyperosmotic laxative. There are other kinds of laxatives, including um, saline laxatives and stimulant laxatives. So stimulant, and, and all this is in this uh, brochure from the APDA. The stimulant laxatives are ones that can be habit forming and you should be very cautious about using it long term. Um, only do it under a doctor's advice. The saline laxatives are ones that contain magnesium in various forms and those are ones that are not to be used long term as well. But the um, hyperosmotic ones like the Miralax are considered um, they're considered safer and so like where I trained uh, in Barrow that was one that was recommended for um, to go ahead and use in Parkinson's for regular use. Okay excellent. Um, another uh, question is my husband can be constipated for two to four days. Is that a problem? It cut out just a little bit. How many days? Two to four days. Okay. Um, so again, by the definition of constipation, if you're having less than three bowel movements a week, that's considered constipation. And so it would be ideal to use some of these, um, some of the easy things, you know, making sure you got the top three. You got the water, the, the fluids in your diet, the um, fiber, which is all including fruits and vegetables, and then exercise. And then beyond that, use some of these other over-the-counter things to help get it going. There was a study published recently uh, looking at people with Parkinson's that had um, constipation. And they compared people that did not use a stool softener to people that do use a stool softener every day. And the people that used a stool softener every day had better scores on rigidity. So as if the, the medication maybe was able to absorb better into the system and they got better results from it. So that's why it's important to control this. And so yeah, if, if your husband's only going every two to four days, that may not, I mean, it's not ideal. So. Did you just say that, um, that using the stool softener helped with rigidity? Yes, they did a study that showed that people that took the stool softener every day, um, they had better rigidity scores. So they had less rigidity than people that didn't. So. Wow, that's fascinating. I'm gonna, yeah. I wanna read that study. Yeah. Okay, um, so is there a problem with hiatal hernia? So hiatal hernia is something that I would, um, see your doctor about, it is, generally it's, um, we have a, I can't quite hear, I'll just like that. Our diaphragm goes right across the bottom of our lungs. And so the esophagus goes through here and then just past the diaphragm is where it opens up into the stomach. And sometimes part of the stomach will, um, get through that hole in the diaphragm and, and kind of get stuck in the, in the diaphragm there and, and that can cause problems. So yeah, it's something that um, is not from the Parkinson's disease, but it can certainly cause discomfort and it'd be something that, that you should get checked out by your doctor and have them recommend any kind of treatments for you. Okay. Um, should everybody, should people with Parkinson's um, have a GI doctor 
and should people with Parkinson's have a different regular checkup with the D GI doctor than you know somebody else at at the similar age? Okay, so that's a really good question. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't seen any information about a difference in risk factors for various GI things, you know, from Parkinson's versus not, meaning like cancers or anything like that. But it's again this um, slowness of the gut and the constipation problems that can arise in Parkinson's and so I would say it's probably a case-by-case -case basis where um, if you're having problems absorbing your medications and you're not getting good response from your medications it could be a GI problem and if you're having problems with constipation you're not going often enough or you're having difficulty evacuating it's certainly worth it those you know, whenever you have problems like that, it's worth it to go to a GI doctor and get things evaluated from their standpoint. Um, neurologists, you know, try and learn as much as this is, uh, of this as we can so we can help, help our Parkinson patients. But again, this isn't our specialty, so better to go to the top. However, for every Parkinson patient, it's probably not necessary. Oh, you froze on me. I don't know if I'm frozen. You think you're stuck? Oh, there you are. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm sorry. You froze on me. So I'm the next. Shall I go into the next question? Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sugar use. Can I eat sweets on a time delay? Agave. What do you mean I'm by so a time delay? Yeah. So are, like. Can you eat sweets and does it matter when you eat sweets? And if I have the question wrong, let me know. Okay. Well, generally the only part of the food we eat that interferes with absorption of the carbidopa levodopa is, um, oh, I see it more. Okay. So protein is the main thing in our diet that interferes with absorption of the levodopa. The same part of the intestine, that duodenum, the same part that absorbs the protein is the part that absorbs the medication. And it's little transporters that can only go so fast. So as soon as the, if, if there's a steak dinner and your pill getting there at the same time in that part of the gut, it can only go so fast taking up the protein and the pill out of your gut and so you may not get the whole pill absorbed before everything goes further down the system and is lost. So that's where you'll see a lot of things online that say avoid protein. Well, you still need protein in your diet. You need protein for your muscles to keep your strength up. Definitely protein is an important part of your diet. It's just timing. So if you can have your um, pill half hour to an hour before you eat the protein or eat the protein first and wait 30 to, uh, not wait you know an hour or two afterwards to eat your protein that allows you to get more of the pill absorbed and get a better response from it if your doses are too close together you can't avoid that just do the best you can for the sugar there's not really anything about Is that sugar where something or, like a can help? oh um well duopa so for the sugar part there's no, no big contraindications either way, other than just um, people do tend to get a better absorption of the levodopa on an empty stomach. Okay, okay. But, but is, it, is it enough of a difference that you're gonna notice from a dessert? I doubt it, um, I doubt it. So the duopa, yeah, the duopa places a tube, I've actually got a tube here. Be right back. There's okay. a tube like this that actually goes into your, the wall of your intestine. And this tube goes under your, it goes through the stomach, through the stomach into the small intestine. And that's where it delivers the medication right out of this into your small intestine, right where it's absorbed. And so that may, um, 
yeah, that may, uh, you know, change. I've got three patients with this now, but um, I don't have enough experience to know how much it'll change with the dietary foods, but um, that may change things. Um, something like the Ritari is an extended release form of dopamine. That one also mentions on its literature that high calorie uh, meal, like having a meal, a high calorie meal at the same time as you take your pills might affect absorption. So just something to know. Okay. Quick question about the feeding tube um, thing. Um, <clears throat> so with the hiatal hernia, if, uh, is a feeding tube recommended? <clears throat> um, that I actually have no idea because the, the hiatal hernia isn't a typical part of the Parkinson's, so I really, I have no idea. In Got general, okay. some Okay, in and general, some um, I see bio some. Should I keep yeah. going? <laughs> yeah. There's a little delay here between us. Um, so in general, <laughs> very early at, at more end stages of Parkinson's, when somebody has a lot of difficulty with swallowing, very rarely, um, but it can happen where somebody will have a feeding tube placed. And basically, again, it's just taking a tube, putting it through the wall of the gut into the stomach, and then nutrition is, is given that way. It can be helpful to either augment what somebody's taking by mouth because they can't eat fast enough or eat enough, to get enough nutrition to keep their weight up. So it could be used for that uh, reason. Or they could have somebody that is so unsafe eating that they really take my mouth and they just get all their nutrition and liquid through the feeding tube. Um, it doesn't prevent them from having saliva go down in the wrong part of their lungs, but it, you know, if they're not eating and drinking, that lessens the likelihood of an aspiration pneumonia where things go down the wrong way. Okay, go ahead. Um, does the bacteria um, in your gut influence uh, the PD medication mm -hmm. response? Great, great question. This is like the new, I don't know, panacea or something. It's in the new mix of questions. Um, <laughs> how to quickly answer that. It, it probably does. It probably does. The, um, do you have a bunch more questions? Because I can do like a little five-minute thing on that at the end. You know what we'll do? We'll let people know. Let's go ahead and do this. I think it's an interesting one. And then we'll let them know that um, they can always send us an email with questions and we'll get answers to them. And I told them that there's conferences coming up this month, so they'll be able to get even more information there too. Okay. So I so, say we do this as the last question. Okay. Do you have others then? The bacteria. Oh, okay. oh this is... Is the last question. Okay, so real quick, um, probably about 10 years ago, there was a guy, a pathologist, a pathologist is a doctor that studies tissue, a pathologist named Brock, B-R-A-A-K. He studied the brains and bodies of a bunch of people, and he came up with a theory. He noticed that the changes in the brain that cause Parkinson's um, he can you can identify that under the microscope by looking for something called Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies are little areas of protein. It's like, it's like the brain cell tries to corral all this rogue protein that's clogging up the brain cell and it corrals it into this little Lewy body. And so those Lewy bodies are markers of Parkinson's disease. And he saw that, that the changes of Lewy bodies actually seem to start in the olfactory nerve that, that um, senses our smell. That's a nerve that's directly linked to the base of the brain. And in the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve is a nerve that controls the gut, goes to the gut, or to and from the gut. So that's the first thing that happened about 10, year, 10 years ago or so. And so people were wondering, well, is that, really the, is that really how Parkinson's develops, that it starts either here through things we inhale or through things we eat? 
and then it and then it travels along the cells to the brain stem the lower brain stem goes to the middle brain stem the upper brain stem and then spreads throughout the rest of the brain is that how it happens well the last couple of years now the big um blow up in information is on the gut bacteria and how that affects us um inside the gut are many many different kinds of bacteria that help us to digest our food among other things and some are considered good bacteria there's also bad bacteria in the gut and kind of to make it simple as long as there's more good bacteria than bad bacteria things are going fine but if you have the wrong complement of bacteria the wrong combination of bacteria the thinking is now that can lead to disease um, I did see one study a while back that said mothers that um, have the wrong bacteria in their gut, they are more likely to have a baby with depression. And so, you know, that's something that's been a couple of years ago. Well, now all these things are coming out about the gut, they call it the gut biome. So what combination of bacteria is in the gut? And so there's there's been some different papers. I've, I've got still another pile of them on my on my pile of uh, papers on my phone to read and it's about all these bacteria and how certainly they affect um, how we digest food they might even be listed to the cause of parkinson's because if your bacteria are wrong that damages the cells the gut that allows toxins in and then the toxins cause those problems that then travel up the vagus nerve into the brain and sets things off um so there's a lot of people now are using probiotics or I think they call them prebiotics, which are things like fermented foods, um, making sauerkraut at home, making other foods. Uh, kimchi is a Korean food that's like considered a, a prebiotic. So a lot of people are using those to try and alter things, but there's not enough. I haven't, I haven't um, read through enough data yet to give a whole talk on it or anything, but it's certainly something that we should look at in the future and keep an eye on. Some people have gotten benefit from probiotics for their constipation. And so, you know, certainly that's something that um, you might consider trying. Uh, but we, it, it would be very interesting to have somebody look into this further and give an entire hour talk on it, because it's very fascinating. Well, maybe we could have you come back and do that, because there's clearly a lot of interest. I mean, we had, we had over 50 people who joined us for the, the conversation today. So, um, yeah. maybe we could have you come back and do that. I would love that. All right. Okay. Um, and the last statement is that, um, from one of our board chair or from one of our board members, his vagus nerve is connected to a slot machine. So that is Ron's final statement. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Reed, I, I really, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. This was like incredible information, clearly applicable for so many people. And we're just really grateful that you're in our community and for your partnership.